Today we're going to be talking about Equal Rights by Terry Pratchett. This is the third chronological book in the Discworld series, Mammoth, um, and my sixth Pratchett book? Yeah. So this is a spoiler discussion for Equal Rights. I'm going to assume that you've already read the book or don't plan to read it if you're hanging out with me here, but I do have a vlog where I talked about it spoiler free. So Equal Rights. I would sum up this book as why. It's the question why, which I think a lot of Pratchett's books so far have been. Challenging why we think the way we do, why are, are, what, why is what's generally accepted to be fine, fine? Why do we accept it and should it still be accepted? So we have this in-world setup that if you practice magic, then it means that if you're a man, then you're a warlock. If you're a, a woman, then you're a witch. Them's is the ways. Why? Because them's is the ways. So when our wizard finds out that he's going to die and he needs to pass on his staff to the next wizard, his staff is pointing him in the direction of Esk. So it's meant to be, right? Like, Esk is supposed, this isn't actually an accident. It's an accident in the most human sense, because none of them would have chosen this, but it's not truly an accident, right? Sometimes he would stop and throw his heavy staff into the air. It always came down, pointing the same way, and the wizard would sigh, pick it up, and continue his squelchy progress. That means that the staff was leading him in the direction he was supposed to go. He didn't just hear about a guy who was the eighth son and was about to have his eighth child, all of which so far have been sons, so surely this one must too. Like, it wasn't an assumption that he made. The staff chose Esk, which means that it wasn't an accident, but in fact, Esk was destined to be a female wizard, eh? Am I reading that right? Am I interpreting that right? Because I think that that adds another layer to it where it's not just... It's not just that the way of the world is being uh, disrupted because of some big mistake. It's actually that this is, this is the progress that the world is meant to be having right now, the progress of equal rights. Which, if I'm interpreting that right, I love that he made it that way. I love that he didn't just say women are starting to rise up and say, hey, we want more rights, and so they fight for those rights, but in fact that they, the, the universe, the magic knew that it was meant to be this way, that like, that women were meant to have the same opportunities as men. And this book was written before I was born, so I don't know exactly, I don't know firsthand exactly what um, what rights looked like at this time. I know that equal rights were certainly something that had been lobbied for for a while, but I'm sure there was still a lot of progress to be made in women breaking through in what are traditionally ma male-dominated spaces. And that is exactly what's happening here. It's, it's a single woman breaking through in what is a male-dominated space. And um, I like this line because I feel like it sums up a lot of what this book does. No one likes magic, especially in the hands of a woman. You never could tell what they might take into their heads to do next. And that's so true in the respect of how magic is depicted in this world as well, because you have the women's magic, which um, Granny Weatherwax <laughs> describes as headology, uh, which is essentially herbology, right? It's essentially, or herbology, essentially it's working with the earth to find natural remedies and natural solutions. And what she has to do is she has to put on a cap and she has to put on a cloak and she has to walk through the, through the city or through the area um, pronouncing curses and saying it with her chest and like really having this presence, this fake, this facade to get people to believe in her validity, which I really like in the dynamics of what, ta what, what Pratchett is tackling here of asking the question, why? Why is our world this way? Why is this the system that we have in place? Is there an actual reason? And that's the question that's continually brought up with characters throughout this story. Because it's not just, it's not a book of men versus women. It's not a book of the bad guys versus those that are, that are enlightened. It's a story of a societal norm that has been accepted by everyone to include the women. I mean, even Granny Weather, Weather, Weatherwax says, if women were better, then they'd be men. <laughs> That's so inappropriate and it's so funny. But even Granny Weatherwax is like, it's just the way it is. Women can't be 
warlocks. It just, it, it's not the way it's done. But you said, oh, I'm saying warlocks, it's wizards. Sorry, I finished this book like two weeks ago. But you said that men can be wizards and women can be witches and it can't be the other way around. That's right. Well then, said Esk triumphantly, it's all solved, isn't it? I can't be, I can't help but be a witch. Granny pointed to the staff. Esk shrugged. It's just an old stick. Granny shook her head. Esk blinked. No? No. And I can't be a witch. I don't know what you can be. Hold the staff. So I love that in this book, it's not, as I said, it's not us versus them. It's a societal accepted norm that we're all challenged when, when fate decides that the norm is to be disrupted. We're all challenged, but why? We've all accepted it, but why does it have to be this way? And Granny is such a great example of someone who is set in her ways, who's very comfortable with the world as it is, and who is forced to ask the question, why? And her response to that is to say, I don't know, hold the staff. And I love that for her. I love that when she's challenged, she's stubborn yet flexible. She learns, she changes a lot in this book, and I love her for that. So, Granny has this headology where in, so in this world, men's magic and women's magic looks really different. And women's magic is more about communing, communing with the earth to meet needs. It's about using the resources available to, to meet those needs. And there is a certain kind of magic in it, but it also, and I think, I think also there's a lot more layers there than Granny really reveals. And I hope in future books, if we spend more time with Granny, no, we will. Alan said that we will. So, um, Alan from Library of Alan Alexandria told me that she's going to be in more books. So good. So when we spend more time with her, um, I really hope that she elaborates on that more because I really think that she undersold what the magic of being a witch is. But regardless, what she's doing is something that's helpful and that's valid and that serves people in a really important way, but she has to don the cap. She has to don the cloak. She has to get loud and get abrasive and, and force some sort of authority under her in order for people to take her seriously. Because simply by merit of being a witch, she's undervalued. Her magic isn't as important and it's not as useful. And obviously it's more than headology because they can control animals. Like they can go commune with it. She can be an eagle. So obviously it's more than just the headology, but I mean, I think even within the realm of, of what she showed us, I still think she kind of undercut, undersold what all is available to her. But I think he made a really good statement by showing, especially probably even more so in the time that this was written, that women oftentimes, and I'm generalizing here, but oftentimes women will choose uh, careers or positions in life that are service, that are a lot more of helping people. And men are often inclined to jobs that are more to do with promotion and uh, that will often garner more power. Again, big generalization here, but I'm sure at the time it was even more so true. And so you have magics that reflect that. Women who are communing with the earth to help people and men who are more about force and strength and power. But then as he categorizes these two things and he makes these two gener generalizations, he then at the very beginning of the story upsets it all and, and gives a woman the power of both and forces people to ask the question, why is this the way it is and why can't she? And then she forges a path to make room for herself and hopefully for others in the future to be able, on both sides, to be able to, to do both or to pick what kind of magic they want to participate in. But with that too, I also love the kind of, the way that, that female magic, that women's magic is undercut, both in society that, again, as I coming, I keep saying, but not finishing the thought, that again, Granny Weatherwax has to, has to kind of pump herself up and put on an air in order for people to give her any sort of validity, even though she undeniably has skills that are powerful and that are useful and that help people. And just the same, when Esk talks to a certain wizard, 
<laughs> it's such a stupid scene. And he says, very, very useful in ritual districts for people who are having babies and so forth. He's, he's talking about, no, 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 I have great value for witches. I think they're awesome for, you know, baby making. Women are good for babies. And this is when he and Esk are talking about why women aren't able to have, aren't good enough to have men's magic. I expect women aren't sensible enough to be wizards, said Esk. I expect that's it, really. I have nothing but the highest respect for women, said Treadle, who hadn't noticed the fresh edge to Esk's tone. They are without parallel when, when, for having babies and so forth. There is that, yes. The wizard conceded generously, but they can be a little unsettling at times, a little too excitable. High magic requires a great clarity of thought, you see, and women's talents don't lie in that direction. Their brains tend to overheat. I'm sorry to say, there is only one door into wizardry, and that is the main gate at Unseen University, and no woman has ever passed through it. I love the idea that, like, oh, women's brains, they kind of overheat when they're trying to do all this sophisticated, complicated, book smart magic. And Granny once again reinforces that when she, <laughs> I don't remember what the context was, but I think I just found it. Ah, look at me. When she says that she doesn't like to read books, uh, she was opposed to books on strict moral grounds since she had heard that many of them were written by dead people and therefore it stood to reason reading them would be as bad as necromancy. <laughs> so you have these these very abrasive like on the surface you see it and you're like oh okay well that that's obviously not the way we think today and then but then you have granny who is indisputably a good-hearted good-natured character reinforcing those very stereotypes because why because that's just the way it is oh i want to talk about this too because i also really love that as pratchett uh as pratchett acknowledges the different types of a witch's magic and a wizard's magic and uh, acknowledges the different kind of how how men are naturally the men's magic the powerful magic the abrasive magic is is naturally more respected whereas with the witch's magic that's more subtle um, he also validates both like as Esk decides to pursue wizardry it's not like it's not like it's because witch's magic isn't good enough. That's real magic, she said at last, and I did it. This is Esk after she was given the staff. One type of real magic, corrected Granny. Don't forget that. I love that even though Granny buys into this idea of, you know, this is the way it is, you just do it this way, even though she buys into that, she also won't concede to the idea that only one type of magic matters. Her type of magic is valid, it's valuable, and it saves lives. It matters. And I like that the story itself isn't a story of um, Esk going off to to play with the boys and be be the one, get the more powerful powerful magic, but it validates that no, witch's magic is different but equal. So you have these on-the-surface discussions, you have these on-the-surface reinforcements, and then you have these very subtle reinforcements as well throughout the entire book, and I just love it. I love that he's, that he's drawing us into this world and saying, here's the way it is. Everyone accepts it until they're forced to ask these questions. And then some of them may dig their heels in and say, no, that's not the way it is. While others like Granny ask those questions, grow, learn, and, and change. But I also really appreciate that Pratchett is always very kind in the way he, he holds these conversations in his books. Uh, for instance, as I said, it's not an us versus them. It's not a the, the mean, tyrannical bad guys versus those that are trying to get equal rights. It's not that way. It's a societal norm. It's, it's this is just the way the world works, and the hurdle to overcome is simply people understanding a little bit more. And, and while Pratchett has a very hopeful tone to his books, in, in the way things resolve and, and the solutions that are, are come to. Generally, he has characters that want to understand each other better and who want to, uh, to adjust and learn. So he certainly has a very hopeful way of writing his stories, but even with that being true, I do appreciate that his stories are very kind to the readers, where it's like, let's address this. Let's look at this right in the eye. Let's ask these questions and let's have these conversations with the understanding that we're all doing our best, that we're all trying here, and we all have stuff to learn. 
I also really love, so, so there's so many things in regards to uh, the magic and the world building that happened in this book as well. Uh, for instance, there was, in the very beginning, whenever we're talking about the wizard that's going to die and we get to see little, um, little ways how, like, the cat rubbing up against something that's not there, it's death. Or where the book talks about how there are different realms and death severs you from one realm, but you just continue to exist in another realm. However, in the, if you're, if you're severed from the realm of the living, then you kind of are also severed from time. And it's like the wizard from the last book. Actually, I don't remember if it was, if it was, um, the light fantastic or the color of magic. I don't remember which one he was in, but the one wizard who couldn't sort out time and, and he was, a, he was the head. He was just a head, a disembodied head. And he was like, uh, actually, I'm not sure that's happened yet, or maybe it's about to happen, or maybe I'm talking about it right now. Like, he couldn't sort out timelines, and it was because he was dead, <laughs> and I love that. I love that we have this very strange little anomaly that happens that's charming and sweet and funny in its own right, and then in the next book, he explains exactly why that strange phenomenon happens. I love that. Little treasures like that are exactly why I wanted to go chronological. Like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, but it's charming, and I love that. But then I also, I love a soft magic system. I love a, a world that feels bigger than the story that it's living in, and magic that feels bigger than the story that's trying to utilize it, and that is exactly how Pratchett made magic feel in this book, how um, it really doesn't feel like I've even scratch the surface of what magic is able to do in this world. And I love how when she was actually learning about magic and there were these scenes of her studying or looking through a mirror and there were these in infinite versions of her and one was like scratching its nose or something like that. Just her time in the university was so chaotic and so overwhelming and just felt like anything could happen and nothing was fully being understood. And I love that feeling in magic or in, in books. Um, there were a few lines. Okay, there was one where she said, magic is easy. You just find the place where everything is balanced and you push. That is not something graspable. That's something so intangible yet understandable enough that it's like, oh, that makes sense to me in my gut, but it doesn't make sense to my head. That's the way magic should feel for me. That's the perfect way to make, because I think, I think, and my husband disagrees with me, I think that if magic were real, it would be like that. It would be this force that's bigger than we can comprehend, than we could control, than we could harness. It's just something that we try to work with, but that we'll never understand. My husband thinks that magic would work more like science. He he thinks Sanderson <laughs> is the way magic would work. I think Tolkien is the way magic would work. It would it would be this force that you can learn to work with, but to to never fully understand. Ah, and that's what Pratchett does here: is he creates this thing that makes sense but doesn't make sense, that works, that feels right, but I can't I can't make a function. I can't I can't functionally explain it. There was another scene uh, where she turns her brother into a pig. She didn't know where the magic had come from, but she mentally faced that way and made a suggestion. That's an amazing line. I love the way magic works in this world. I mean, I love Pratchett's writing just in general. I think that his prose is astonishing, and we'll talk about that too in this video, like we do in every Pratchett video. I think that his prose is astonishing. It's glorious. I love it. But the way he uses that incredible use of language to also describe magic is magical. Okay, my kids just came home, so I will wrap it up, but I think I talked about the most important things. Granny, I love Granny. She is such a phenomenal character, and I'm really excited to get to know her more. I've kind of already talked about her. I also really like Esk. I really like the idea of having somebody in this world who is kind of the forerunner of being able to be a witch and a wizard. What does that look like? What does that, what does that conceivably, practically look like? I don't know, but I'm excited to see. I'm excited to actually see her in future books and see what that practically looks like as a trained wizard, but also hopefully a trained witch. I can't wait to see that in this world. And I can't wait to see the future where people are training in whatever category they want to train in. I'm excited to see the world as it evolves from from this point in this particular topic. So thematically, I loved the themes of this book. Plot-wise, I think it was solid, you know? I mean, I don't think that it was anything like, whoa, this is an incredible plot. It was 
person born, given, chosen one. She's essentially a chosen one because if my interpretation of the staff scene is correct, then the universe chose her. Or magic, I guess. Magic chose her. So um, she is the chosen one to break who go, to break through and do something that no one else has done. She sets forth to do it. There are obstacles. There are tasks that she has to overcome, people that she has to convince. She gets there. She does the thing. The whole world explodes. <laughs> And, and it has a really, you know, explosive ending. So plot-wise, you know, good, solid, excellent, good, why not? Character-wise, very good. I love Granny so much. Themes-wise, I love the way Pratchett weaves themes into his stories and leaves them open enough that the conversation can keep going even as society keeps going. There's still an open door to talk about it today and in, in our own, in the context of today. Magic-wise, 10 out of 10. I love the way Pratchett writes magic. And prose-wise, let's talk about prose for a minute because I have to. This is a story about magic, where it goes, and perhaps more importantly, where it comes from and why. Although it doesn't pretend to answer all or any of these questions. Pratchett, you summarized your book. That was the very first sentence of this book. He summarized it better than I did. I love the visuals. Listen to this. The storm walked around the hills on legs of lightning, shouting and grumbling. Are you kidding me? I could never come up with a sentence like that. Are you kidding? I'm gonna read it to you again. You weren't listening close enough. The storm walked around the hills on legs of lightning, shouting and grumbling. I will never think of a storm the same way. That is such a magical, beautiful description of a storm. How dare you, Pratchett? Mist curled between the houses as the wizard crossed a narrow bridge over the swollen stream and made his way to the village smithy, although the two facts had nothing to do with one another. The mist would have curled anyway. It was experienced mist and had got curling down to a fine art. That is brilliant! That is a brilliant description of, of mist. Not only is it it's very descriptive and very visual, I see that mist rolling in, but it's also goofy and funny. And Pratchett is so funny. I love the way he, I love the way he weaves his themes into the stories and the characters, and he weaves his beautiful, magical, phenomenal prose into descriptions so that it just all, it's like, it's magic. His writing is magic. I cursing my girl. No need to look so shocked. You'll curse when the need comes. When you're alone and there's no help and, uh, and people aren't showing respect. Make it loud. Make it complicated. Make it long. Make it up if you have to, but it'll work all right. Next day, when they hit their thumb or they fall off a ladder or their dog drops dead, they'll remember you. They'll behave better that next time. <laughs> Don't think you've won because you haven't, she snapped. It's just that I haven't got the time to mess around. You must know where she is. I command you to make, to take me to her. The staff regarded her woodenly. That's so, <laughs> that's so funny. There's another line, which I know I didn't underline and I kick myself for it. But there's another line where, um, oh, it's the pig one. It's when she's trans when she's transformed her brother into a pig, and uh, and and Granny tells her turn him back, and she's like, well, why should I? And the line was, um, but anyone reading this would know that she that she'll give in by the end of this sentence or by the end of this paragraph, and then the very next sentence is her saying, all right, I'll turn him back. Like that's just so clever. It's like it's it's so blink and you miss it. Where if you're if you're reading passively, if you're not actively absorbing everything that's being said, then you might miss the just the sheer brilliance of of him say of him acknowledging I'm writing this story, and she's gonna give in by the time I finish the sentence. Okay, I've given in. Like, that's just so funny. That's so good. Okay, one more. There were more old people. The world was full of them, said the wizard. Yes, I know. And now it's full of young people. Funny, really. I mean, you'd expect it to go the other way around. I just, I, I don't know. I, I love Pratchett's humor. I love his character work. I love his world. I love how the setting is a character of its own, like the way he describes a storm or mist. The way the world acts has its own characterization. I love the the discussions had in the book and how open-ended they are so that, I say this all the time, but the way Pratchett handles themes is not telling you what he thinks all the time. He is, he is on the notes sometimes. He definitely has opinions and he puts them in his books, but it's, it's not 
sit down and let me talk at you. It's an invitation to the discussion. And a lot of times he doesn't present all the answers. And I like that. I love the way he does magic. I love the way he does the world. I, I think his plots are good, but I think everything else is better. <laughs> I just, I had a great time. Equal Rights was amazing. I am going chronological, which means Mort is next, but I'm not going to lie to you. I'm kind of sad that I'm going chronological at the moment, even though I just validated why I do this. I just want to read more witches. Like I want to read, oh, it doesn't tell me on the back. I want to read whatever is next in the witches series. So I hope that one comes up soon because I want more granny. I want to see what's up with Esk. I want to see where, where her story takes her and what her life looks like after she's finished with her training. I want to see, I want to, I, this is a good one. Anyway, I'd love to talk with you about it more in the comments. I post videos every Tuesday and Thursday on this channel, Mondays and Fridays on my other channel, which is always linked in the description. I'll see you again soon. Bye.